Hello, coming up, a parrot celebrates 110 years of colourful life. The Chinese are stepping up efforts to get pandas out of their cages and back into the wild. He looks like he needs a good night's sleep. You've heard of snakes biting men? Well, here's a man who puts the bite on snakes. We look at a special shelter in the Thai province of Hua Hin to rehabilitate orphan animals. Larry and Nico, two young bears, are enjoying their first outings at Berlin Zoo. And Japan offers its argument in favor of resuming whale hunting. A Bangladeshi snake charmer called to remove two servants in a suburban home near the capital unearthed more than 3,000 deadly cobras and hundreds of eggs. He then dined out heartily on what he'd found, but you'll see what I mean in just a few moments. Residents and police said snake charmer Dudu Mia captured thousands of young cobras at two houses in Narayaganj near Dhaka. Mia was called in by resident Mantu Kasai after his wife found two large cobras on their property. The fine triggered panic among neighbors who fled their homes. But for a practice snake charmer for 43 years, catching the snakes was child's play. Helped by his assistants, he dug underneath the floors of two houses and unearthed a slithering stockpile of thousands of snakes. After counting his catch, Mia set out to prove to villagers that he's truly the master of the slimy serpents. Now, if Mia had a publicist, he'd probably say that he eats more than a hundred of these at one sitting while they're alive. But if you watch closely, I think Mia really likes these snakes, not the taste of them, that is. The theatrical Mia says that eating serpents in such quantities sometimes gives him hallucinations. But he always sleeps well after he's digested the reptiles. He now plans to look for more cobras elsewhere in the neighborhood, but hasn't yet decided about what to do with the rest of his catch. That's got to hurt. Cobras, which are highly venomous and endemic to Bangladesh, often nest in houses there. But this isn't such a bad thing, as they frequently rid the houses of rats and other domestic pests. Bon appétit! Flying Dragon, otherwise known as Long Tong, is about to take its first tentative steps into the great outdoors. The cuddly panda has spent all its life behind bars, raised in captivity at a panda reserve in Sichuan province. China is launching a new initiative to reintroduce pandas born in the reserves back into the wild. China's wild panda population is currently hovering at the dangerously low figure of about a thousand. In its first taste of the great outdoors, Flying Dragon looked like a total natural, bounding up trees over rocks and happily chomping on young bamboo.
Wei Rong Ping, an expert at the Wolong Panda Reserve, is in charge of the new project of trying to bring the panda out of captivity to familiarize itself with the open and wild environment. Out in the open, the panda learns about lots of new things which it doesn't get access to in captivity. It develops its vision, sense of smell, and its brain. Pandas are one of the world's most endangered species, threatened by human poaching, rapid development, and the panda's notoriously low libido. As for Flying Dragon, getting away from the confines of captivity appears to have been a joyful experience. This is one of the poorest cities in the world, Dakar, the capital of Bangladesh. The people today have got some entertainment in the form of a monkey and an abandoned puppy, which is being treated to a unique form of interspecies love. Maina, the monkey, left childless by an animal trader, has found a substitute for her lost baby in a small mongrel pup. Keeping a close eye on spectators in a Dhaka slum, Maina's maternal instinct for her puppy is so strong, she won't allow owner Sultan Mia to approach. Just try getting close to Maina, and she bears a set of fierce monkey teeth and a frightening hiss. Owner Mia said he bought Maina, but couldn't afford to keep its baby. Sad and lonely, Maina began to treat the puppy as though it were her own baby, showering it with maternal care. Now the story of this loving monkey and her puppy is traveling the streets of Dhaka, drawing onlookers every day. Poor Mena, kept captive on a chain, struggles to keep hold of the dog and seems overly protective of the bewildered canine. <laughs> Stressed by the attention and the fear of having this baby taken from her, Mena becomes aggressive and quite dangerous to any unsuspecting onlooker. Gently picking fleas from their young is a normal monkey habit, but for this adopted puppy it's become the focus of her preening and picking. Could this be the only dog in Bangladesh that doesn't have fleas? <laughs> They may be confined to cages, but these are the lucky ones of Thailand's wild animal trade. Each year, thousands of animals are bought and sold along Thailand's borders, and most of them end up living less than happy lives as pets. But this small, privately run animal shelter, three hours south of Bangkok, in Hua Hin, is a sanctuary for those animals who are rescued from the illegal trade. Run by volunteers, the shelter houses more than 40 animals, including a two-year-old tiger named Meow. Animal shelter manager Edwin Week found Meow chained up at a gas station. She was severely malnourished and after several weeks of negotiating with her owner for her release, Edwin took her to the shelter and, with the help of a Thai vet, nursed her back to health. Gibbons, a species of monkey native to Thailand, are a popular exotic pet. Edwin says most of these that have been rescued were living in tiny cages and had poor health due to a bad diet. The animals come from tourist attractions or in most cases have been pets for private owners for a few years and the people are not able to handle them anymore. Once the gibbons are brought to the shelter, they're given health checks and treated for any conditions they might have. 
They're then put in cages and cared for until they're strong enough to be released in the area. Edwin has set up several gibbon islands near the shelter where the animals can get used to being away from humans before being released back into the wild. The shelter is on a large piece of land owned by monks at a nearby temple. In Thailand, temples are places where people bring sick or unwanted animals, so often the monks themselves will bring animals to Edwin. Originally from the Netherlands, Edwin came to Thailand and soon developed a passion for the country's wild animals. He set up the centre just over a year ago and allows volunteers from all over the world to come and help out with the animals. Edwin and his volunteers are currently building new, bigger cages and he hopes to keep on expanding the facility. The only problem is keeping wild animals is officially illegal in Thailand, which means Edwin takes a personal risk each time he rescues a gibbon. The year of the monkey. Lunar New Year heralds monkey business worldwide. Monkeys, monkeys, monkeys everywhere. Money, money and more money, this, according to most Chinese, is what the New Year will be all about. According to the Chinese New Year calendar, it's not just the year of the monkey, but the year of the golden monkey, believed to bring in money and wealth. The word for monkey in the Chinese language is Yuan Ho, which sounds similar to the word for resources, which is interpreted as rich resources, meaning more money during the year. In South Korea, albino monkeys were flown in from Africa to perform traditional games and dances for dozens of excited South Korean children. The monkeys were fitted with bright colored traditional Korean costumes called hanbok. A hanbok is usually worn during Korean Thanksgiving and New Year holidays. Chinese soothsayers predict the year of the monkey will bring the stock market boom a freer yuan currency and a hefty dose of political chaos. They say the year will keep everyone on their toes with revolution and change. But to me, it just looks cruel. Say hello to Larry and Nico, twin bears. Spring-like temperatures made it possible for these two to stage their first photo shooting in Berlin. Mum cautiously emerges from the cave, but the cubs have no concerns. Nico and Larry are so curious about their outdoor enclosure, with places to see, food to eat and games to play, that the bear keepers are worried the young twins might hurt themselves. Everything is new for the little bears and staff will have to monitor them very closely to see how they'll develop. The water ditch poses some danger, but mom is very careful and if one of the little ones gets too close to the water, she's there at once to call him back. Larry and Nico's proud parents are mother Puna, born in 1990 in the eastern German town of Leipzig, and 20-year-old US-born father Paco, who arrived in Berlin from Washington, D.C. The bears, which Germans call eyeglasses bears because of the rings on their faces, are of South American origin and belong to the endangered species list. One reason why every birth around the world is registered centrally at Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo. Curiosity is the driving force behind every youngster, and the twins are no exception.
However, he's going to find out the hard way if he's not careful that the tree is not going to give him a leg up to the top of that rock. Meanwhile, twin brother has just scaled a mammoth tree and the other driving force, Sleep, is about to take over for him. Mum, who's seen it all before, seems to be well equipped to take care of one baby, but two could prove to be a lot more difficult. But the world is a big and beautiful place and all this young bear wants is to see it all before lunchtime. What he doesn't realise is Lunch was served 10 minutes ago. Kabul Zoo is at last getting back on its feet and was packed with families recently during a holiday in Afghanistan. The zoo had been very light on animals since the war, but thanks to help from other countries, the place is boasting some fine animal examples. Donatella, an Asiatic black bear, was playing in her cage following an operation on her broken nose. Veterinarians anaesthetized the bear a couple of days before and took some samples and biopsies to establish exactly what the problem was and Donatella was given appropriate antibiotics. Until the samples come back, her treatment can't be determined. Like most of the animals in the Kabul Zoo, Donatella was a victim of someone's brutality. She was hit with a club in an attack that scraped the skin off her nose. It'll take days before they can finally determine how to treat her. Despite her condition, Donatella was in a playful mood. Somebody donated a volleyball and she just loves playing with it. Although we don't think she's grasped the basic tenet of having air in the ball affording a greater degree of fun. Asiatic black bears prefer heavily forested areas, particularly in the hills and mountains and moist tropical forests below alpine elevations. In the summer, they may be found up at altitudes of 10,000 feet and will descend to lower altitudes in the winter. It's known that they den up for winter sleep in the colder areas of their range, but it's not known if they do this where their range is consistently warm. In fact, little is known about this bear in the wild. They're mainly nocturnal, sleeping in caves or trees during the greater part of the day. They may have established territories of up to four to eight square miles. At the moment, Donatella is stable and looking pretty good. Agata village on the southern coast of Japan, Shikoku Island, was once a thriving fishing village known for its sardines. But for the last 15 years, the sardine catch has been decreasing steadily and the fishermen, whose livelihood depend on the fish, have been suffering. The fishermen blame the dwindling fish population on brides whales, which cavort in popular fishing grounds around the village. They say the whale population has been increasing steadily since 1987, when commercial whaling was banned. As heated discussion swirls among countries in support of and against whaling, the fishermen of Ogata have turned to whales for a livelihood by showing them to tourists. The International Whaling Commission Scientific Committee will meet soon in Shimonoseki, which used to be known as one of Japan's four biggest whaling towns. Japanese government data shows that fish landings have been halved to six million tons in the last 20 years, supporting the claims of the fishermen of Ogata. Scientists and Japanese fishery officials say whales consume several times more fish than humans, and their growing population runs the risk of tilting the delicate balance of the marine ecosystem. In order to study the eating habits and other aspects of protected whales, Japan dispatches fleets of research whaling every year to catch the marine mammals. But the research activity draws the disapproval of environmental groups which claim that by allowing research whaling, Japan is slowly paving the way to the resumption of commercial whaling, an exercise which nearly wiped out some species in the past. As the fish catch decreases, the fishermen have had to take steps to enter the fish tourism industry. 
Other villages on Shikoku Island used to hunt whales also. Agata was never a whale hunting village, although the whale was a popular food on the dinner tables there. Now about 50 fishing ships are registered as whale catching ships. And during the whale watching season between March and October, more than 10,000 people from all over the country come to Agata to watch whales. Whale meat was an important source of protein in an impoverished Japan after World War II, but it's become a gourmet food over the last few decades as prices rose in line with falling supply and it's no longer widely eaten. The majority of tourists who come to see whales say viewing and eating whales are two different things. Children in the future will be told that whales aren't for food, but they're for looking at, like goldfish. Perhaps they don't need to know what was done in the past, but some people feel strongly that whaling should be preserved as part of Japanese culture. British war leader Winston Churchill's foul-mouthed 104-year-old parrot refused to surrender to news hounds after a British newspaper tracked the bird down and discovered it was still alive. Charlie the parrot, who reputedly kept Churchill company during World War II, was apparently famous for occasionally squawking four-letter obscenities about Hitler. The bird, regularly referred to as he despite being female, lives in retirement at a garden centre in the southern English county of Surrey with an African grey called Smokey. Prime Minister of Britain during the Second World War, Sir Winston Churchill was born into the English aristocracy. He held various senior positions in the military services, serving with distinction before entering politics in 1900. Sylvia works for Peter Oram, who says Churchill bought the parrot from Oram's father-in-law, pet shop owner Percy Dabner, in the 1930s and kept it until his death in 1965. But members of the Churchill family question the veracity of the story, denying that Sir Winston ever owned a macaw. Experts from Chartwell, Churchill's former home, now in the care of heritage agency the National Trust, doubt that he even had a parrot, although he was known to have a number of pets. Sylvia Martin, who manages Heathfield Nurseries, where the venerable parrot has lived for the last 12 years, said she belonged to Winston Churchill until he died in 1965. Her boss, Peter Oram, was asked to take them back when Winston Churchill died at Chartwell. Sylvia said the 104-year-old bird doesn't say very much anymore. Reporters had tracked Charlie down and had been trying to get her to talk, but she told Reuters the bird had mellowed. She does speak, but she doesn't swear very often. She added that she couldn't say on television what Charlie did say, but agreed she sometimes said things about the Germans. Sylvia says that Charlie is very fit for her age, but pulls her feathers out as they grow because they're very itchy. She's full of fun, she bounces up and down, dances to the music, makes a lot of noise, screeches, and she's a happy bird. If only she could find her head. Oh, goodness for that. Oh, just a little to the left, up a bit more. Ah, that's just a spot. <laughs> Majasa, 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 Majasa,